Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our uh, conference. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> What's the name? <laughs> Globalizing. <laughs> Globalizing our community college curriculum. Um, the GCCC, because we always say GCCC, um, the GCCC conference. Um, my name is Wen Hao Diao. If you cannot say my name, just remember it sounds like two question words. What, who, when, and how. When, how. Um, I am an associate professor in East Asian Studies, and I'm also the co-director for the Center for East Asian Studies. And I'm here to welcome you, all of you, uh, to our conference. And for those of you who are coming from out of town, out of, out of town, I hope you are feeling the warmness of our welcome quite physically, uh, quite literally. And please enjoy your time here in Tucson. Um, I would also like to take a very brief moment to introduce you to our Title VI teams. So like I said, I, um, I'm representing the Center for East Asian Studies. And here are our Associate Director, Alice Yu, and Outreach Coordinator, Lucy Ling, who has been very, very helpful in coordinating all of this. And we have the Center for Middle Eastern Studies Director, Mahmoud Azams, and where's Abby? She's still working, <laughs> right? So uh, our uh, CMES uh, Outreach Coordinator, Abby, and uh, CLAS Coordinator, Katrina, are also outside. Um, and uh, we also have Circle. I can never remember the full name of Circle, so I apologize. <laughs> but Kate Mackay, uh, Associate Director of Circle, uh, who is also here. And um, so the theme of our conference this year is counter-narratives. And um, to say the very least, it's a very important time to think about this theme because of the political vulnerabilities and the changing global context. But also I think it's very important to think about counter-narratives because of the three centers that we are working here, um, Center for East Asian Studies, Center for Middle Eastern Studies, and Center for Latin American Studies. We represent voices, cultures, societies, that are often not really talked about, at least in a way that resonates with the people in those world regions, uh, in the dominant narratives here. Um, I don't know if, if you share these feelings, but every now and then I read the New York Times, which I do like, um, and whenever I read their coverage about China, and then I look at their comments and I feel the moment of cringe. And I'm like, you just don't understand. Um, and I think that's exactly why we need to focus on counter-narratives, all the voices and perspectives and experiences that we don't get to see or hear through the dominant narratives and in the work that we do. Um, and in that, on that note, I think we're all doing very important work here. Um, and I believe that all of us uh, do work in the humanities, in languages and cultures, and also in arts. And tonight, we, are, we have the privilege of listening to a talk given by an artist. And I think that is also another form of art of counter-narratives, right? These days, we often talk about big data, STEM. But really, human knowledge predated all of the STEM fields, right? And so we really need to think about the importance of counter-narratives, both in world regions, but also in disciplines. So now, I will have my colleague, um, Professor Ji Hei Kim, um, assistant professor at the School of Fine Arts, Arts, <laughs> uh, who will uh, who will introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Ji Hei Kim. I'm assistant professor at the School of Art and College of Fine Arts. <laughs> it could be confusing. Um, I'm really honored to introduce uh, Professor Tong Park today as uh, I have long admired his works and projects. Um, currently a professor at the University of California, San Diego, Kyung Park founded the Storefront Art and Architecture in New York in 1982, which is a non-profit organization committed to reframing the relationship between the city and, and the life of its residents. He served as its director until 1998, engaging in public discussions on the most urgent issues and challenges that impact the constructive environments by bringing together artists, architects, and designers with the general public. 
Professor Park participated in the second Gwangju Biennial as a curator in 1997 and served as the artistic director and chief curator of the Anyang Public Art Project in 2010. As an artist, he has held numerous exhibitions, including his solo show titled Kyung Park New Silk Road and Museo de Arte Contemporaneo de Castilla in Leon, Spain in 2000, 2010 and Imagining New Eurasia, a sequence of three research art exhibitions at the Asia Culture, Center, Asia Culture Center in Gwangju, South Korea from 2015 to 2018. Last year, Professor Park co-curated an exhibition with Soi Jong for the Korean Pavilion at the 18th International Venice Architecture Biennial. For today's talk, Professor Park will introduce the theme of the exhibition, 2086, Together How. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kyung Park. Okay, uh, hello. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I'm very uh, excited to be invited to speak here at the uh, uh, University of Arizona. And uh, thank you for uh, being such a, a great host uh, to associate with a wonderful exhibition uh, that uh, is in the gallery there. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, uh, as, uh, as it was said, uh, my lecture is going to be really short. I only have 115 slides. So. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, as uh, Professor uh, Jihye Kim has described, that the exhibition that I uh, uh, worked on at the recent career uh, uh, pavilion was actually a project, of, an idea that I conceived and then proposed to the committee. Usually, there's a committee to select who the next uh, artistic director of the Korean pavilion uh, for the Venice pavilion. And they accepted this idea, and it was called 2086 together how with a question mark. And then with uh, Soik Chung, uh, we together uh, developed uh, this concept uh, uh, through the exhibition. Um, the, first of all, it was about bringing together uh, architects and community leaders uh, and also artists uh, to really kind of question about how uh, we might work together to endure current and future environmental crisis until 2086, which is in the title, the year where the global population is predicted to peak according to the United Nations. The premise of 2086 together, how, question mark, is to interrogate our Faustian ideology of progress and how we have sought unlimited material pleasure through industrialization, westernization, and liberalism, and much more, and our reparation of the past colonial exploitation would be the first step in our reconciliation with nature. Uh, this concept is uh, developed throughout the exhibition. The first uh, collaboration, collaboration between the architect, we basically, so we and I, basically found uh, three different communities, small community in South Korea, uh, actually through another project which we call Sivichon 2.0, which I explained later. And then we invited uh, architects to met, to collaborate with them. The first site is uh, in a district called, very small district called Badani, uh, which is, uh, uh, Originally, uh, in, in the early uh, uh, modern period of uh, South Korea, this was an important uh, port. But as you can see in this Google map, now the city has grown exponentially. Incheon City is actually uh, a port, a major, uh, the biggest port, well, second biggest port, I think, so, in South Korea. It's actually adjoining Seoul City, which is the capital. Uh, and it is now the second largest city. In fact, the whole Seoul metropolitan area is around 24.4 million 
more or less, which is 52 percent of our entire South Korean population lives in this region. And you can see here that uh, you can't see the models. Okay, uh, I should have converted to uh, PPT. Uh, but uh, is there a point for you? Uh, anyway, you've seen the highway in Rangoon, right? Well, the city uh, planned to uh, build a, a kind of a throughway from one part of the city and went through this Adari district and completely destroyed that area as a resistance to that freeway construction that community uh, activists and leaders organized the people to fight against it. Um, as you can see, they did, uh, Koreans, uh, South Koreans love demonstrations. There's demonstrations almost every day. <laughs> and uh, especially weekend, you can't go into the city side of Seoul because there's demonstrations, blocks all the traffic. But uh, you, as you can see, you know, there's uh, this press conference at Incheon City Hall by the group calling themselves citizens as owners. In other words, citizens are uh, important in the, uh, the governments of the city, demanding the recall of local politicians, especially the mayor, who's a kind of Mr. Developer slash Mr. Bulldozer. And then also it involved many generations, their idea, including uh, 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 children. They also, uh, Space Team, which is uh, the organization that we worked with, it's a kind of a, uh, organization that represents that community. Uh, a cultural uh, center, uh, and they also uh, started a residency program uh, with their performance, which is saying no matter what challenge they exist on their t-shirt. They also used 52% uh, of South Korea lives in high-rise apartments, and 52% of South Korean population is 52 million. South Koreans kind of somehow love this number 52. <laughs> and uh, they used the apartment building as a sort of a billboard for their resistance movement. Of course, they also demonstrated right on the site during construction. And somehow they managed to stop the construction now. Uh, and then as a result, they wanted to just figure out what they could do with this uh, now an empty land. So Incheon Citizens Roundtable on Urban Regeneration and Innovations to correct all the urban mistakes according to their uh, view. Installation of the direct historic village information map to kind of uh, to uh, start making citizens think about, community people to think about that there's a history in this district uh, and how important that is to preserve. Uh, also, urban repair centers were a bit, uh, 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 created. It's called uppercut. It's kind of illustrating their kind of struggle with the uh, developments as a sort of kind of boxing match or, 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 or with some connotations of violence. Installation of benches for community meeting uh, places, alleyways throughout uh, this area because this is where a lot of elder people kind of like to hang out, right? Sitting around uh, in what is called very important kind of urban future of the Korean city is alleyway or walk, which is basically small, narrow pedestrian uh, streets, as well as uh, what they call ghost marketplaces uh, to bring people together. Marketplaces always where people find it themselves, meet other people, and to trade, you know, gossips and stories and other news that's, uh, Koreans are really good, South Koreans are really good at even in, in the uh, very high-tech society, is still the rumors and, uh, and uh, 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 gossips are very good. That's why a lot of international companies actually do their beta testing in South Korea because it spreads very really fast. Uh, space team residency, neighborhood mobile art factory, uh, and then lots of uh, new upstart uh, businesses like uh, like uh, this. Uh, uh, a cultural, uh, let's say, store, so to speak, direct translation would be. And then a cafe called Starting Point, which is a gallery and a cafe. And then 
bookstore called Flying Butterflies, uh, kind of translation. But uh, the, uh, this district originally used to be a lot of bookstores uh, uh, before they had disappeared. So part of it is to bring them back. And this is space being space. Uh, they took an old building and a uh, two-story building. It's quite interesting. And they turned it into like classrooms, meeting space. Uh, in fact, uh, 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 they really uh, uh, historically recorded the, uh, the, that area architecture and uh, histories, almost like kind of like urban arch anthropology archaeology. They also had started uh, uh, kind of a seed bank themselves, collecting seeds from the community members, and they started to think about how, like meetings like this, how to develop the construction site uh, uh, of what uh, the industrial road that they were building, and then transform it into green parts for the community. And this is kind of illustration of what they imagined uh, the, the park to be. Uh, in the exhibition, uh, was, uh, this section was titled as a ruin as a future, future as a ruin, collaboration between urban train lab and the space beam. And uh, uh, we invited uh, local uh, artists, painters, who have painted uh, throughout their uh, 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 period of trans transformation of the, of the area, showing how that, that development, uh, 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 I mean, South Korea is all about you know, uh, developments, uh, hyper-developments, and how that is also bringing some of the negative impact to uh, some residents uh, who are actually displaced or uh, their memories are destroyed and the violence of this development is portrayed by these paintings which was reproduced in vinyl and was cut out and you can see some uh, uh, sorry you can see some blank area in the bottom paintings which is actually uh, a map of the islands in the ancient day uh, that used to exist now look, it's all kind of uh, now is leveled and reconnected by the land fields. Uh, and, and in the center, in the totem, is uh, there's a kind of a photo history of the Gaddafi uh, resistance movement uh, by the images that are shown already. Now, an Incheon area uh, is continues to be influenced. In fact, South Korea is the second uh, most uh, a country with the second most uh, uh, land uh, infill extension to the ocean then at the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, so in Chen Bay could, like in this picture, could be completely filled in the future. Of course, you know, you have to have a golf course because South Korea is also crazy about uh, golf. And then, uh, and, or that if it's a flooded with sea rise, then it could return to the original shoreline, so to speak, and it could actually recover, hopefully. Uh, what is very unique in the western coast, south, southern, actually mostly western coast of South Korea, uh, unique in the worldwide and also eastern coast of China, uh, is the mud flat. Uh, in China, actually has one of the highest level of tide uh, differences. And it's enormous mud flat uh, that is, has historically was provided for seafood uh, uh, production. Another project was called Destructive Creation. It was a collaboration between SOA, which is Siding Architects, and Dang Tang Tang, which is a group of young people with uh, revitalizing cities, old center like markets and hosting local culture-based uh, guerrilla events to explore how contemporary nomad could help to revive local uh, local legacy. Uh, this is actually an empty house. Uh, actually, the house is Japanese uh, house that was built during the Japanese colonial period because uh, uh, Gunsan was a, a one of the uh, major port to send rice and other agricultural products for Japanese consumption. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and here is a news report about how 
2,349 houses are actually empty in the center of the South City, which is about 250,000 uh, population. So what happened in South Korea is that what happened in the United States uh, some time ago, that the center is starting to decay and then uh, extends out to the suburbs. But it's not like a sprawl like here, uh, like Phoenix or Tucson, but it's more high-rise complex apartment buildings. Uh, uh, what is the uh, beginning of what they call, urban is called uh, donut, which is empty at the center, but quite fat and rich in the suburbs, right? So SOA uh, documented all these empty uh, uh, houses, and they kind of proposed that they should develop in the future into green spaces uh, rather than to rebuild. Uh, it was inspired by first uh, earlier work by Udan Tang Tang, who uh, built a very small, uh, on the picture on the left, there's a little uh, alleyway with the yellow bricks, small little alley. <laughs> you walk in and there is uh, two pictures on the right. There was an empty uh, on your space. They turned it into a community park uh, and so on. Hunsang is known also because of the Japanese uh, colonial period city of strangers. Uh, and kind of like, if you know, like uh, Shenzhen in China is uh, touted as that. Uh, people come from all different places. So it is also similar, is continuing happening, but in a different way now, is that it's being kind of colonized by young generation of people, uh, digital nomads, so, so to speak, most of them, who move away from uh, Seoul city, metropolitan area, and uh, because they're feeling uh, they need a different opportunity uh, for their future, uh, away from uh, heavy competitions, high cost of living. And so they're migrating to the outskirts and uh, it developed what we call relational population is that, that because South Korea is the size of Indiana, 100,000 square kilometers, one quarter of California, uh, but it has extensive uh, uh, freeways and high-speed trains and all kinds of transportation, buses and other things, that it's really easy to travel from one end, one quarter of the, uh, of the country to the other quarter, basically uh, two and a half hours, uh, and they're very affordable. So young people are starting to live in different uh, cities in the country some spend 90% in Gunsan, 10% in Seoul, or some spend 50% in Gunsan and spend 30% in Seoul, 20% somewhere else maybe where their parents live or so. So what they're uh, developing is a relational uh, community based on what they work, what they're interested, the kind of work and ideas like these people are all not from Gunsan, they're from somewhere else, and they gather in Gunsan to work on a project to uh, renovate the top of a uh, huge uh, roof of a uh, uh, abandoned, what used to be Gunsan uh, cultural center, and uh, make a skateboard park, <coughs> which is kind of influenced by American military base at New York Gunsan. <laughs> and uh, what they call is a DIT, not DIY, uh, do it yourself, but do it together. The idea that working brings people together. And, and then also that local businesses uh, that are also started from, uh, uh, as a middle aged uh, uh, people from Seoul moving to Gunsan, and they start like a cafe uh, or uh, kind of a, a program. I we found also this in other cities where they provide programs for young people from big city to come for the weekend or one week or one month, and they provide all kinds of projects, and things to do, working with uh, local uh, people, uh, like in this uh, uh, building here, and it's called Local Rise, you know, and so the idea of localism, they have workshops, they have meetings, they have projects, and then there's another space we found that was like a maker space, and uh, uh, that these young people coming, they have a, a place to work, uh, uh, that provides uh, tools, trainings, uh, and then so SOA uh, uh, created these tools uh, using old 
uh, tools, hand tools. They didn't want to use power tools. Uh, modify them in a kind of interesting way where they wanted to make tools that not one person used, but two or more people work together to use one tool, like in this case, tearing down this old uh, uh, Japanese uh, empty house. And then uh, that was part of it was moved to uh, uh, the, the Korean community in Venice. And uh, they also created kind of a complete uh, uh, three-dimensional photometric of the, uh, the house and uh, created a, you know, like videos like this, uh, which that they showed the rise of sea level uh, that would uh, take Gunsan back to its original uh, 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 shorelines, because much of the Gunsan was actually infilled from during the Japanese period when they built their, their own port there. Uh, and then another project was called uh, 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 a Migrating Future, uh, uh, NHDM architect with the largest in Worsik, Worsik Kim. Worsik Kim was a person that who I've known many years, an artist who works in a, 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 a migrant workers from outside of Korea uh, in, in an area, a city called Ansan. And so this idea was to kind of investigate spatial temporal landscape of foreign migrants in rural communities around Ansan City. They mostly work in the villages, uh, uh, like working with uh, agriculture, because of depopulation of the uh, villages in South Korea. Or they work in the small uh, manufacturing industries in the countryside. And uh, so this is an installation of showing that they made six kind of and one of them is this six collages. One of them is this where train number four that comes from uh, Seoul City Center is where a lot of people, uh, foreign migrant workers, comes to Ansan in, uh, in a neighborhood called Wurgokdong, where they meet. Uh, this is where also the migrant worker first comes uh, before they you know, spread out. And in the weekends, they come there uh, joined together. And so all the different countries people come uh, to on this train. Uh, and it's kind of a cultural mixing uh, 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 line. And so they kind of imagine what it'd be like if that train itself turned into kind of this festival, uh, a train of festivals inside. Uh, and then uh, they present uh, different things. But one of, just, one of the things I want to show you is that also they made these beautiful drawings of uh, called Home is Not the Vinyl, because a lot of these foreign migrant workers, in especially farm, they live in a vinyl house. Vinyl house that is you know, like a greenhouse right, on the farm. And it shows, like by the drawings, you can see how they live by kind of furniture, refrigerators, uh, vehicles, toilets, uh, you know, even like cushions and bed and stuff. And, uh, it's kind of anthropology of the kind of living condition of these workers. And then this is a tip. They also drew uh, kind of a what could be a typical building in the center of this neighborhood, uh, uh, that I mentioned in Ansan City. And you get kind of this high density of multicultural spaces, like this one is like where they sleep, like a really tight collective uh, like, uh, uh, motel, which is kind of similar to what is called uh, 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 students. Uh, uh, yeah, one room, uh, uh, I forget the Korean word. Huh? It's not a hostel, it's like, Tiny little rooms where students go, uh, they study in a, uh, another city, and they live in this like really tiny little rooms with a desk and a bed. Uh, and uh, it's a sort of model after that. And then you also see uh, like, uh, like shops like, you know, mobile phones are important or calling cards, uh, international calling cards, we call them home, hair salons, and visa, uh, you know, 
photographs, the copy of visa translation, and so on. And, uh, and then they also interviewed uh, much of the foreign uh, immigrant workers about questions about what their experience like in South Korea and what uh, how they imagine uh, about uh, uh, their home uh, where they came from. Finally, there was a video project called uh, A Future by artist named Jae Hyo Jung. This was an interesting three channel video about a fictional story that he made up about a, a little baby child, a girl, who was born without uh, hearing, uh, vision, touch. She had no senses at all. Uh, but she could see the future in her mind. Future, what would be like, in, uh, uh, like a prophesized image of, of uh, the future of the, uh, the climate endgame. So the government and all kinds of institutions was really interested to know what she see. They tried to kidnap her, some tried to kill her, some tried to protect her. They made like uh, a special exhibition. There was all kinds of theatrical performance, drama on television, movies, and she became this kind of a, uh, uh, a child god, so to speak, because she received billions of views uh, in the media each day. And this is an image of, of three people arguing uh, is that one uh, is a, 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 a left is a scientist who is trying to get into her brain. And the man is the government official trying to control the whole situation. Uh, uh, and, then, uh, and then the woman next to it is the mother. And they're arguing about, you know, and so it's that kind of obsession about the fear about the future. Uh, in fact, I think that's what we are experiencing these days. We have uncertainties about our future, things that are seems to be going on out of control. But the central to the exhibition, uh, uh, Soek and I, we made a game uh, together how. It's a quiz show, let me show you. It's a quiz, uh, kind of a television quiz show, 70s style. They invite visitor to play future climate Endgame by asking to respond three questions, I mean 14 questions on social, political, and cultural issues from various fictional representative of future organizations. Four players at time are invited to each session, ask these questions, and then they have to respond uh, by pushing these buttons. And the video monitor in the front that you saw here is basically uh, recording their responses uh, with blue, green, and yellow buttons. And lights go up. And so it's kind of a registry of the scores. Out of 420 colored lights, a 12 meter by 2 meter scoreboard, which is kind of uh, 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 influenced by the world's first uh, computer uh, in 1945, I think or any it was made out of two light bulbs. Uh, and it's about, the, and then there's a text in front of it, which is about history of progress. And then their scores are computated, and they're reflected and written on the uh, 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 blackboards, handwritten, uh, and uh, cumulative daily scores. And they influence uh, uh, representing global sea level levels, the global temperature, sea level, refugee migrations, population, water, Gini coefficients, and all of these things, right? So, um, so these are fictional characters. Uh, they, they're, they're generated by uh, AI. And uh, so like, for example, uh, here is a sheep, uh, 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 Zaid, uh, are not he? Uh, oh, no, actually, this is, no, this is, actually, I can't see it here. But uh, it's too small. Uh, Elijah, uh, I can look at it. Elijah Kim is a bishop of church of GDP, gross domestic product in Seoul. So he asked the question, like, uh, we are facing serious crisis. People no longer believe in GDP. How can we convince people to believe the doctrine of growth forever that will take us to paradise? Number one, 
tell them the growth forever is the only way to enjoy life and that it's impossible to do with less material consumption. Two, tell them that those who will not join the church of GDP will burn in hell. Three, perhaps we should join church of Negro. Now, uh, Tenzin Dorsey is the Deputy Vice Minister of Global Council of Love uh, from Ting Fu, which is in Bhutan. And the world, the question is, world is short of love. We must raise production of love so that we can live more harmoniously. How can we increase production of love and distribute it widely and equally throughout the world? One, instead of GDP, we should raise GLP, gross love product. Two, greater GAP is only possible through the greater GDP, or three, greater GLP is only possible by lowering GDP. Uh, and then uh, this is, uh, on the left, is uh, Mohammed Ali Hassan. Uh, he's the Secretary General of Unit of Nomadic State uh, Citizens. And then uh, on the right is uh, Mohammed bin Salman Rashidi. Who I, I mean, names of places all picked based on certain issues, right? Like I picked like Mohammed bin Salman is the, uh, the Crown Prince of Saudi, right? You know. But then I put the Rushdi, Salman Rushdi, which is the Iranian, right? Persian, right? So, you know, Arabs and you know, Persians, you know, uh, kind of, you know, differences. Right? Anyway, the Crown Prince is, is not in Saudi. He's actually in Russia. This it's the bar to Musk. And we must protect our resource of eco -terms. They were reducing our profit of customer services. To continue the destructive, creative destruction of our planet, we must one, continue to bribe politicians. Right? Two, buy out renewable energy industry. Three, give up fossil fuel and invest in eco-terrorist projects. Now, you know, this is kind of strange, right? Because in just a few months ago, we had this huge uh, COP23 uh, 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 gathering, and the leader was, uh, it was in Dubai, right? I mean, Dubai is not exactly the most environmentally sustainable city, right? Uh, and the next one is going to be in uh, uh, where? You know, it's going to be in uh, 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 Azerbaijan. Uh, what is the city? Uh, uh, oil city. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, but you know, the the, the COP23 was uh, led by Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al. La Yan, who's the president of Supreme Petroleum Council, the Arab United Arab Emirates, and Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, which is a state-owned oil company in UAE. So I mean, you kind of take that, uh, uh, spin it around your head, and then. Um, Angela Berkeley is a senior advisor of Center for Teutonic Civilization. She's from Halle Neustadt, which is a place I worked before. It's like the biggest uh, communist utopic city that East Germany has built. And our great replacement is now turning into great displacement. Our cities that we leave behind as we move to better climates because of global warming are taken by the wretched colored people. How can we? Uh, keep them, sorry, them from destroying our great Teutonic heritage. One, build the city wall, keep them out. Two, burn and destroy our city so the barbarian cannot move in. You know, it's like burn and slash war, right? Warfare. Three, they can stay in our city if they maintain them until we come back. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, well, and this one, okay, uh, Alfred Ray Prince is regional director of Jackson Hole, too rich to fail security services corporation. <laughs> Our tech millionaire clients are now under siege from marauders and barbarians who are desperate for water and food in our underground mansion. Our clients should enjoy their swimming pools, home theater, wine bowls, and I forgot the bowling alleys, uh, without any disturbance. What should we do? Give them some water and food, make them go away, to massacre them, to set example so others will not come. Three, 
help feel them so that they can help us to protect from others. Anyway, so I mean, it goes on, you know, there, there's more, okay. And let me uh, pick one of Namja here, right? He's called a uh, Dalexa, which is a flower for his Korean male and drugs in his K pop, right? But he's the rest mix. Uh, he's a customer service director, deep part for self assured destruction uh, in Anaheim. Uh, parody of mutually assured destruction, remember that? Mad during the Cold War. This theme park, built for now defunct Disney World, offers all of your most feared climate and their scenario in a highly realistic, immersive experience. We ask you, what is your worst nightmare about the future, right? Fear future. One, losing my home and property under the rising sea or, or a burning uh, wildfire. Two, having to move to another country because of rising temperature. Three, losing my farm to drought and desertification. So as a result of, and so the result of those uh, scores from these uh, games, um, I started to write annual report. And this is something like 2000, I don't know, 48 or something. And uh, this shows that, uh, uh, this is 2045. Borders of nation states are under increasing attack. They are on the verge of collapsing. And not just because the continuous and relentless rise of climate migration. Rather, they are being challenged by two other ways. Firstly, borders are now increasingly being seen as a colonial apparatus and heritage. The idea that it was to protect the sovereignty of territorial state born out from Treaty of Westphalia, 1648, in the Holy Roman Empire, uh, which is north of uh, Italy, is the German territories, the colonization of the rest of the world ever since. According to Muhammad Ali Hassan, the Secretary General of the Union of Nomadic and Stateless Citizens in Mogadishu, which is one of the fictional characters in the game, the border of today's are markings of colonialism that were embedded then and continued their control of the globe today, such as the division of Korea. Secondly, the climate migration previously dubbed as economic and political migration is now also being identified as active colonial reparation. Non-Western people claim that their movement across border is a movement to redeem their compensation for the centuries of exploitations of their land, labor, capital under Western colonial liberalism, like for example, Guatemala, maybe, uh, you know, Banana Republic, you know, the, 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 the pineapple bananas and all that stuff, overthrow of the uh, democratic uh, government by CIA, you know, and the law. Another one is, from them, moving across imperialist borders are acts of political economic justice, along with reconstruction of their own cultural heritage. According to Amira Cabello, activist lawyer for the International Union of Reparation of Colonial Exploitation, which is based in Kinshasa, Democratic Congo. This is, you know, Congo <coughs> is a place where the King Leopold II of Belgium held as his private property, and he had killed millions of people, like cutting off their arms and uh, fingers and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and then, uh, such movement is strongly opposed by Angela Berkel, the uh, senior advisor of Ipsover, because German cultural history, racial identity cannot be polluted nor diluted by migrants who do not belong here. Uh, this is kind of stuff that you hear from uh, the political group uh, uh, AFD, uh, uh, the German uh, party, right? Nationalist party. Um, and then another one version is, is from 2037 is that Z, the global security elites of the world, founded by no other than Alan Musk. <laughs> Thank you. I, it's, it's my uh, uh, interpretation of this character. 
has happened the next step in the in the evolution of the mogul's business model after Tesla and X and so on. Alfred Ray Test, uh, who I, I think I described already, uh, was instrumental in convincing Musk to upstart this new industry that some experts have begun to call as Parasite. Now these are models uh, of a company in Czech Republic who's building and marketing uh, these uh, tech billionaires, uh, uh, little Czech, right? Um, with the climate endgame generating multiple, uh, multiple of complex and unexpected crises around the world, such as fails day, which kind of what we're kind of currently going through in the process of, that followed the fail banks. Uh, maybe that's what's going to happen in China. Uh, the rise of paramilitary forces is in the make of the balkanization that is replacing globalization. Remember balkanization coming from the Balkan, the, the, the fragmented Yugoslav in the 1990s? Uh, and it, it was no longer uh, sufficient, I'm sorry, Ms. Bargain, no longer sufficient for companies like the TRFS2 to just secure residential confines of the tech billionaires, uh, with many nation states unable, unable to manage increasing political and economic pr pressures, their military industrial complex are now undergoing dramatic privatization, a bit reminiscent of post-Soviet Union, the result is obvious. Following the history of French Foreign Legion, Blackwater, remember that's American uh, uh, Wagner, Wagner Group, Russian, Executive Outcome South Africa, FAU in Congo, Rapid Support Forces in Sudan, including forces like Boko Haram and Mujahideen, much more robust, capable private military, paramilitary forces were in need to protect the entire infrastructure of many of these digital industries, especially their nuclear plants that power all important data banks, which they start to build. With their territories and network being so vast and competitive, the parent military forces of Z alone has grown to more than 1.24 billion personnel with a budget that rivals once incomparable Pentagon, making a fellow Musk has thus thrown himself as the world's first digital warlord. So you can see some of this in the my Instagram, which is I, is my first uh, my, uh, uh, link with Instagram. Uh, I stopped in 19, 2050, but if you join, maybe I'll continue until 2086. Um, all of this was kind of uh, 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 inspired by Civicho uh, uh, 2.0, which took place in Kunsan City in 2023. What happened was that we did a kind of a uh, we made a game. Uh, it was uh, 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 kind of a monopoly-based game, but uh, more deviated. It was man standing. All these students came, like I described, you know, these uh, young people coming from Silver City, the good side. And then we made them uh, wrap stones with plastic tapes, and we became their own identity. And you know, these days, you know, young people are very good at you know taking photos. Okay. Took it outside outside this workshop and then kind of like took the photos uh, for themselves to put it up in their Instagram or whatever. And uh, and uh, of course, you know, we had like this the dog that was part of the game of the, the, the workshop space. And then the game starts, and then we made this kind of uh, a roadmap, so to speak, and the, all different players, uh, uh, different uh, 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 people, organizations, businesses that were involved in regeneration of the Busan Center. And they play this game. And what I really love this picture is because you see, there are people on the table sitting there, uh, they were commentators. <coughs> Like the, in the sports game, you make a comment, commentator, commentator about what's happening in the game. Because they also knew uh, the people and uh, businesses and organizations. So they kind of mix up with the real and what the game is. Reality with what's being played. 
we video uh, the whole thing, and what it looks like is a kind of like like a television set, right? You know, like a movie set. So I would love to, in the future, my dream is to do this game throughout different towns in South Korea, because I think this game makes really interest, interesting uh, understanding of the cities, towns, and villages uh, a way of kind of exposing, uh, showing uh, their culture and social, social structure uh, to the game. Now, why did I do all these things? So let me <laughs> let me read this. I'm going to give you a sermon, okay? Are you ready for the church? <laughs> the premise of this exhibition is to wonder why we are so isolated when we are supposed to be so connected through globalization of information, finance, and even culture. Why are we so insecure about our future when so many of us are living at unprecedented level of wealth, consumption, and freedom? Why then is the idea of progress taking us closer to extinction than to our perfection that it promised? These questions together wonder how and when did the climate endgame begin? Allow me to speculate that this could be around 1492, the year when good old Columbus landed in America, or when the Greek conquista uh, was complete on the Iberian Peninsula, uh, kicking out all the Muslims. This was the beginning of the rise of the rest of Europe and later the West that has come to define and dominate the way of life for many of us on this planet, including other forms of life, either animate or inanimate. But how could 90 men in three pitiful ships would lead to command all the oceans of the world within just half a century. Was this when the Christian world took a small step for man and one giant leap for mankind across the Atlantic and began to dominate the world and its nature to start and to proceed? Is the great North Atlantic garbage patch that floating graveyard to the gyre that allowed Columbus to reach America and the triangular trade of slaves, cotton, and textile that begot the Western colonial imperialism. Setting off the globalizing chain of production, consumption, and waste was then the 1492, the year when we truly became the slayer of the earth no longer is caretaker. What about the third of 150,000 tons of silver and gold that the Spanish Empire extracted from the mountains of Peru and Mexico that was used to pay for its trade deficit with China? So you know, trade deficit with China is not just recent memory. Queen Elizabeth I, used three quarter of the profit from 4,700% return by the pirate and the slave trader named Sir Francis Drake to clear England's entire foreign debt. What about the British India Company's opium trade under Queen Victoria helped to pay for the British trade deficit again with China? Were they set forth by the same gyre that produced the great North Pacific garbage patch, a dirty laundry of a history that was never washed? You know, this called a patch, right? You know, it's like the uh, size of Texas. Uh, what about four and a half 
4.25 million South Asians who serve in the British India Army to defend Britain in both periods, were they compensated equally as the English soldiers? What about the destruction of South Asian textile industry by the British Empire that may have transferred, transferred the birth of industrial revolution to England? So the environmental crisis did not only uh, uh, it's not only about recent or upcoming despoilments. It has a significant history already to apply equal level of ecological responsibility to newly and historically polluting nations altogether is really asking the former uh, to forget centuries of industrial agriculture and technological pollution by their colonial masters. This is nothing less than extending the privilege of the colonial era into environmental era, akin to so many industrial and energy companies that left their pollutions behind to local communities after relocating and closing. It is as if the British Raj donated its environmental destruction to the people of South Asia as its parting gift to their independence. The future of climate remediation is absolutely bound to the past colonial exploitation. But will the profiteers of colonial and environmental legacy, the consumers at the empires of progress, pay back what they owe? They are barely aware of their own legacy of environmental destruction in distant lands and times when they are not even aware of such in their own land and time. Economist Utisha Patnaik once calculated that the British extracted about $45 trillion from India from 1765 1938, more than 17 times the annual GDP of the United Kingdom today. This is on top of tens of millions, perhaps even hundreds of millions of South Asians who worked unpaid or underpaid to make the British more prosperous. And we're doing this continuously right now to people all around the world who are making only a dollar or two a day. What is the statute of limitation on bringing past ecological devastation as a crime against humanity and nature? Higher population, higher production, and higher consumptions are the triad of progress. Everything must be more and upward in the growth forever economy. In this much happier feedback between human and nature, than the mortality inferring Malthusian catastrophe, it is nature that must be sacrificed to the creative destruction so that our prosperous life can continue. So the idea of progress, therefore, is the most spectacular power that rest has ever brought to the destruction of our planet. But can this be continued? Does it have an end? The grand master of the temple of GDP may very well be Edward Louis Barnet, AKA the father of public relations, who happens to be actually fourth cousin or nephew of Sigmund Freud, who he promoted his uh, books and his work, effectively translating the libidinal desire of his double, double uncle Freud into mass consumption. He revolutionized the capitalism of necessity into capitalism of desires. He turned perhaps all of us into Pablo, Pablo's, Pablo's dog. You know Pablo's dog, right? Children, right? Story. 
in townside shopping malls where we could unleash our stratospheric but never could be satisfied desires in the cold, windowless, suburban Eden for our national wealth. Yes, we are told to recycle and reduce pollution and so on, but very few of us are brave enough to stand up against the freedom of consumers' choice, our most cherished form of democracy. We want to convert our cars into electric, but we are only willing to make them smaller, buy less, or use less, or not at all. It's patriotic to buy and buy, and waste and waste. After all, we're not citizens anymore. We're just tracked consumers to further income inequality. But such consumptuous happiness is not for everyone because we are not all equal in this wonderful world of voodoo capitalism and in autocracy. I fear that climate change will continue to favor the dominant race, economy, and even geography as we have previewed in we were not all in this together, COVID-19. Many nations in global south, along with developing nations elsewhere, are conscripted to the front line of stormy environmental crisis. Then I wonder how racism and colonialism, which were deeply sown into nature and us, would react to the condition of regression when scarcity, not plenty, becomes the rule of our future. So, after surviving that, the mutually assured destruction of the Cold War, are we about to enter, sad, the self-assured destruction? In a race against time, Celsius, meters, NRR, TFR, PPM, PPT, MWH, KWH, and most of all, percentages have become the tarot cards of our destiny. As a scapegoat, they create a grand fantasy that the problems are all out there. But no, they are deep within us. We need to fix our broken self as a civilization, and only then can we reconcile with nature. But are we capable of such self-correction? Did the idea of progress in making us to look only forward, strip our, of our ability to be reflective? In the era of controlling the future, which is what idea of progress invention is, or creating the future, not only that nature, but also of our own, is it coming to an end? If so, then who will control our future in the future? I say it will be history, but will not be of ours. History, which we always thought was about us and written by us, now wants to liberate from us. Like nature, history fears its own extinction along with everything else that have encountered us. History now wants to be self-determined and no longer wants to be the necropolis of our great deeds. The real universal history is not Tardos liberalism, is the one that will put our history on trial for crime against humanity and nature. It wants to find out how in the hell we came up with the climate ending. So this is the premise of the Project 2086, Together How. And this was how it was presented at the Korean Pavilion for the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2023. The exhibition asserts that 
Not only would the environmental crisis force us to invent, invent a better eco-cultural paradigm, it will, in fact, be our best and perhaps our last chance to become a better humanity. Together, how, question mark, therefore, is the question that would take us to the year when our global population is supposed to peak. And remember all the way along the way, the crisis is not the environment, it's us. So you can actually get the catalog uh, we actually published in uh, Italy. Uh, it's pretty cheap, uh, today's standards. Uh, it's very small, I forgot the green one. Okay. My brain is no longer it's completely dysfunctional. Uh, it's very small. It's like a little tiny, but it, you know, and what it looks like something like this. Uh, but what we also collaborate with Eflux, uh, 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 one of the most important online art architectural journal, and we made uh, this tomorrow's myth uh, series of essays uh, by three people, uh, Western writers, who were invited by Eflux and three South Korean writers uh, invited by us. And they're very interesting uh, texts. They're around 3,500 words or more. And uh, uh, yeah, this is what it is. We also published it one version in Korea later, uh, but that is only distributed in South Korea. Uh, I said Korea is not distributed in North Korea. So this is the end of the show. Thank you very much. If you have any questions. I, 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 you're all depressed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there is no tomorrow. There is no hope. This is your last lecture in your life. <laughs> uh, a simple question. Um, why 2086? What is it about 62 years? Is um, this point that you achieved? Uh, what's the point? Did I make it? No, no, the, 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 the year 2086. Oh, I mean, that's just the arbitrary number. You know? I, 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 I thought maybe that, that it, it, had, it, it had some. It's kind of like also like a joke because all predictions are wrong. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Especially coming from the web, right? But I didn't answer your question. Uh, ask me more. Um, I'm okay, oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. 62 years, um, I'm, uh, I'm not around. Mm -hmm. Um, is there a uh, a softening of the blow of what we're facing? Do we think that this is? Um, well, you know, we, we don't really know. You know, yeah. I, don't, you know, I mean, uh, many people think that it's going to be more like kind of like, you know, like they desire a soft landing for the nation, right? <laughs> you know, Biden uh, by dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, but I think it's kind of like, a, it's going to be uh, more like, it's not a, a, a French style execution guillotine, but it's more like slow death. And it's going to be really like, if I could like speculate, it could be a very challenging and, uh, uh, and it could be uh, like, uh, like a slow torture death on town or base islands. Uh, but I don't think that's really that important. I think what's important is that to recognize, you know, I, went, I, I, I gave this uh, 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 speech, preaching, preach, preacher, right? uh, a style thing uh, at, uh, uh, at New York, uh, like a year ago or something. Uh, and it was called World, uh, it was called uh, WTA, uh, World, no, WT, we're trying to, oh, yeah. But it was, it was a cultural, uh, 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 more 
uh, WTA, that's what I remember. It's like World Trade, the WTA, uh, it's like airline, right? Just debunked airline. But it was, you know, and I gave, and, and, and the, the conference was, everybody was uh, architects mostly, and they gave all this incredible uh, environmental uh, solutions. Like how to save Coral Gable, and, you know, Coral, not Coral Gable, that's a town, right? The Coral Reef, <laughs> like, you know, so, I mean, and uh, and the other you know like uh, protecting species and the species and uh, you know how to make you know uh, 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 non uh, fossil energy and all, all these new materials and all these things and, and then I, you know what I, I learned something from that conference because I was the only one who didn't present any kind of design I just said this you know nightmare stuff you know? and uh, and. I learned from that, uh, which is, uh, I think, you know, you might disagree with me quite a bit about this, but all these projects are really amazing. They're really great. You know? In fact, the organizer, the curator, she said to me, she said, oh yeah, we already figured out all these problems. They're solved. I said, ah, really? And, and then I realized, okay, what if that I said that all of these projects are just Totally greenwashing. It's for us to continue to live the way we are living now. It was a kind of like do good things so that we just keep on growing and 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 we keep on consuming more wasting as we always have done. So I became very suspicious of that because it basically, I think the, word, the, the key thing here was that, 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 that all of the greenwash was that it showed that we were unwilling to change. And uh, we really have not understood the problem. We have technologies, information, and data, and knowledge of but we are very short of understanding. So that was true. Thank you very much. Um, very fascinating. I love the, the names. It's very entertaining. Um, one thing I did find fascinating is that, like, so like, a lot of it, like, as you spoke of it, it almost seems like a slow death, an apocalypse, all these type of things. And I remember a discussion where, I think it was a group of writers or film directors, they are going back to the question, why do we constantly visit the theme of the apocalypse, you know? And we do see it in post-apocalyptic literature and films and so forth. And I was thinking about it as we were watching, because all these scenarios is frightening and it is jarring but at the same time i was thinking about and i don't know if this is part of it but do you believe that recognizing the issue recognize the problem with ourselves as you pointed out i, I do agree with you in the fact that the crisis is that we're, we're not changing we have this like this mindset of unlimited growth and even though it's like what was it 20 something years ago I'm like it can't go on forever like, I mean, Starbucks goes up to this height. It has to stop at one point, you know? We can't put Starbucks in Mark. Well, okay, maybe one day, but still. Somebody else, something else will come. Yeah, exactly. McDonald's, Starbucks. Well, they already have it, but you get the idea. Yeah. So, do you think that recognizing, like, what could happen and what probably might not happen or whichever, there is hope in analyzing a what if apocalypse? Does that make sense? Like by seeing this, there, and if we can recognize the issues with ourselves, there is hope from seeing that their apocalypse may come. And if we recognize that it may come, maybe we can avert it in some ways. Well, the apocalypse idea, right, I think uh, uh, it's, a, it's always been a, a fascination, a fascination history. 
I think religion, especially probably the Christian religion, have really appropriated that and became a very powerful tool for acquiring membership and contributions, I say. And is it enormously successful? I mean, it was once a state governance and also educational institution as well, right? So I mean, uh, lost that uh, uh, part of their power to this nation state, which is, by the way, I think is the most totalitarian uh, form of statehood we ever had, uh, and, uh, uh, which is another subject. But I think what we have is the fear of death, fear of death. And we haven't really, really, as a society, as a humanity, really explored that very much. We've sort of neglected it. You know? We sort of like, we don't want to deal with it. I mean, as an individual, uh, we are you know, very little prepared to death. The only thing that we do is the, uh, the medical industry is trying to keep us alive as long as possible. Uh, in fact, I speculate they even would make they intend to do a business model to make money even after you're dead. Right? Uh, but we haven't explored a really kind of like develop knowledge, even let's say science of that at all. In my uh, this is something that I haven't really studied very much about, so I'm kind of speculating that I think, uh, uh, intuitively. But it is an interesting subject. And I think the result of uh, apocalypse comes from our lack of knowledge with death as much as we would cherish and, and, and knowledge about birth. We sort of like abandon the other half of our existence. The other thing is that also I think is that we take ourselves too seriously. We value ourselves more than we really are. Of course, I mean, when you think about the Western world has brought to this world, it's incredible uh, what has been revolutionized and accomplished. Western world has brought, I mean, you know, scientific revolution, discovery, you know, you know, uh, you know, urbanization, uh, all kinds of technologies. I don't know the fourth revolution or fifth revolution, maybe. Each one of these has uh, enough alone by itself to change the world. But Western world was able to create one after another continuously for 500 years. And we're living in an enormously privileged uh, time. Uh, that gave us enormous sense of power. And we see ourselves as the greatest thing ever appeared in the universe, perhaps. You know? And this confidence, overconfidence, also uh, hinders uh, the inquiry of depth and, and, and interrogations and uh, I mean, you know, the, the really soul searching. Are. Because right now, it's all about money. You know? Everything is turning into commodity, commoditizing. Money. Like so, when I when I listen to people um, from who lived in ex-communist world, I mean, of course, you know, it was great you know, at all, but you know, maybe it was certainly better. But uh, and did become part of North Korea. Right? Uh, but however, they do tell me something sometimes, things like, you know, we had a lot of time. We didn't have to work all the time. We had a lot of time to spend with our friends and family. And uh, uh, we didn't think so much about money. It was there. 
but it wasn't all encompassing in our daily life. It didn't become a lifelong obsession. And if I'm gonna kind of like uh, like uh, make you like really uh, like uh, uh, I don't know, uh, envious or something, in the Soviet Union, they all had housing. I was told. You know how much they spent per annual income in their housing? Four percent. It could be seven. I can't remember the number. You know, but I mean that sounds pretty good. You know, of course, they didn't have a great apartment. I was flying, in, you know, when I was flying in Tucson, I saw on the hills there were these houses that are uh, like really spread out. You know, right? I was, like that kind of configuration is very rare to see. And uh, and what they didn't have, they had it in some other way. They had small apartments. You know, their kitchen was shitty, right? Didn't have to, you know, all the technology that you had. But in a way, they may be, uh, you, you know, uh, like, they may be, uh, li they may have lived more in the future than less. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. Thank you for your questions, and thank you, Professor Park, for the wonderful presentation that I'm sure is going to give a lot of us a lot to think about. And yeah, have a good night, and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you.